So your first step in factoring is always to look for something that is in common that you can take out. All right, and so if I look at this first one, I'm gonna look at the numbers and say, well, five and four don't have anything in common other than one. And then I'm gonna look at my variables and you can see that you could take a Y out. And so I am gonna do that. I'm gonna pull the Y out in front. And then I am going to have the five with one Y left over and then the four with no Ys left over. Once you have factored it, you're gonna set each factor equal to zero and solve. That's automatically solved. This one, you're gonna subtract the four and divide by the five. And so you will get zero and negative four fifths as your answer, all right? If I look at the next one, again, I'm gonna to look to the numbers and the variables to see what I have in common. Here I do have a Y in common, and so I can take that Y out first. And I have the y on the outside, then I have y squared minus 9y plus 18. Um, for this one, I'm going to look for factors of 18 that add up to give me 9. So if I go through my factors of 18, I'll see that 3 and 6 multiply to give me 18. Specifically, I need it to multiply to give me positive 18 and to add to give me negative 9. So when I do this factoring, I'm actually gonna say, well, that's y minus three and y minus six. They have to multiply to give me positive 18 and add to give me negative nine. And so now that I've done that, I can go back through and I can set those equal to zero. And once again, the y is already solved. Then I'm going to set each one of these equal to zero and you're gonna see that then y equals zero, add the three over, you get positive three, add the six over, you get positive six. And so those would be your answers for that one. So this second method for solving is what you're typically going to do if you do not have a B, a little center section. So if you remember in standard form, it looks like this, AX squared plus BX plus C. So if your B is a zero, you're just going to have an X squared and a constant. All right. And so when you have that, it's usually easiest to solve by taking the square root. You don't have to worry about factoring. Um, you can just solve by taking the square root. Now this is a special case, x squared minus 81. If I were to tell you to factor that, this is a special case, x plus nine, x minus nine. And so if I were to solve this by factoring, I would say, well, this is the special case where I have my conjugates. And you can see that you would get positive nine and negative nine as your answers. But when you're solving by taking the square root, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to get this x squared all by itself. And so instead of doing the factoring method, you can actually just get that x squared by itself. You would add your 81 over, and you would have x squared equals 81. When you have something squared, like a variable, <clears throat> equal to a number, you can take the square root of both sides. And so if I take the square root of this side and the square root of this side, the square root of a square is just the variable. So x squared with the square root is just going to be x, when you have a variable involved, we all know that the square root of 81 is 9. But when you have a variable involved, you have to consider the positive and the negative root. And so if I were to do this, I would say, yes, it is 9, but I have to consider the positive and the negative root here. Positive or negative 9 would actually be my answer. And so you can see that when I did the factoring, I got positive and negative 9. But when you have just an x squared, you can just get it by itself and take the square root of both sides, all right? And that's actually the rules. If you look at the bottom of page 201 there, simplifying radicals, um, the first thing you need to know is how do I take a square root? It's really simple if I have 81 or 36 or 100 and I'm doing the square root. That's beautiful, I know what the square root is. But if you do not have a perfect root when you're solving by this method, you do need to remember how do I simplify those um, radicals, those square roots. And so simplifying radicals is at the bottom of that. Um, 
write it as a product of prime factors. So I usually recommend using a factor tree. And so we're gonna review using factor trees. Simplify the roots with the perfect powers. Anything that pairs up can come out. If it does not pair up, it stays in. If you take multiple things out, you multiply them. If you leave multiple things in, you multiply those as well. If you have a radical in your denominator, it is not standard form to leave a radical in the denominator. So you do have to multiply the top and bottom by that radical. And so we're gonna do a couple of those. Simplify. All right, so let's look at this first one. If I have something big like this, I am gonna recommend using a factor tree. So if you don't remember factor trees, this is all the way back from, we did them probably in algebra one, and you would have done them in middle school as well. All right, you either used a factor tree or a factor ladder. I don't know how you did it, but same concept. I typically always do the smallest prime on the left, um, smallest or at least the easiest prime. So when I look at 450, I think, well, five is gonna go into that because five goes in anything that ends in a zero or a five. All right, so I put five there and I'm basically just dividing. 450 divided by five, well, 45 divided by five is how many times? Right, nine, yes. And then I can put a zero there because it's 90. And then five is gonna go into that again. Five goes into nine one time and then into 48 times, all right? And then I'm gonna look, well, five doesn't go into this, but what does go into 18? I can say, well, a two goes into 18. And then I have a nine, two and nine make 18, and then three and three. When you get to all primes, you're done with your factor tree. All right, you're done with your factor tree. Now, here's where it is. If it pairs up, it goes out. If it is single, it stays in, all right? So if it pairs up, it can come out of the root. If it's single, it's gonna stay in the root. And so I am gonna say, well, the fives pair up. I have two of them. So a five can come out of my root. The threes pair up. That can also come out of my root. You will notice that the two does not have another two. So the two is going to stay inside of the root. All right? It doesn't matter if they're side by side. It doesn't matter where they are in the factor tree. If there is another one of them, they can come out. Okay? Pairs come out. If more than one thing comes out, you're gonna multiply it. So I have three and five that came out, so I have a 15 on the outside. If I had had multiple things on the inside, I would have multiplied those as well, all right? And then I am done with that particular radical, all right? Let's look at the um, fraction. Fractions are actually handled the same way you just do them individually. And so you can think of this fraction as the square root of 50 over the square root of three, all right? And so I'm gonna take them individually. I'm gonna take that 50 and I'm gonna do exactly what I did um, on the left-hand side there. I'm gonna split it up. You can see that I have a pair here. So the five can come out. The two will stay in, all right? And then I have the square root of three on the bottom. Now three is already prime. I cannot split that up anymore, so that is as factors as I am going to get it. But standard form for radicals is that I do not have a radical in the denominator, all right? And so the way to get rid of a square root is to multiply it. So if I were to multiply this by the square root of 3, if you'll remember, square root of 3 times the square root of 3 is just not a square root of 9. And what is the square root of 9? 3. So when you multiply a radical by itself, a square root by itself, you get rid of the root, all right? That's how you get rid of a root. Now with fractions, if I multiply the bottom by the square root of three, I also have to multiply the top by the square root of three, all right? Because I, I'll change the fraction if I don't do that. So on the top here, I have a five on the outside, and then I have a two times a three on the inside. So I have square root of six here, all right? On the bottom, I have square root of three times the square root of three. All that does is get rid of the root. So on the bottom, I just have a three. Now I want to tell you this because this is one of the most common mistakes. You can only reduce outside to outside or inside to inside, all right? So what I mean by that is I can reduce the three and the five if that was reducible. Let's say that was in a six out here. Or I could reduce inside to inside, all right? I cannot reduce three, which is outside of a radical, with the six, which is inside of a radical, all right? I cannot reduce outside and inside. 
So this one is done. Five squared of six over three is as simple as you can get this. You cannot reduce this anymore, okay? If I had had something reducible with the three over here, I could reduce it. Or if I had a radical down here that was reducible with a six, I could. But at this point, I'm done. All right? All right, so when you're solving, you have to know how to simplify those radicals and you have to know the process to actually solving. You are going to want to get that variable squared completely by itself, all right, including the coefficient. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move this 100 over. So I'm going to add the 100 to both sides. I'll get 3x squared equals 100. And then I am going to divide by that 3. And now I have the x squared completely by itself and I can take the square root. So if I take the square root of both sides, I get the x by itself, and I get, don't forget, the positive or negative root of the square root of 100 over the square root of three. Square root of 100 is one that hopefully you know, plus or minus 10 over the square root of three. And just like we saw when we were simplifying, we need to get rid of the radical that is in the denominator. So we're going to multiply the top and bottom by the square root of 3. So my final answer for this particular one is going to be x equals the positive or negative 10 square root of 3 over 3. And you can put it just like that with that positive and negative in front, but don't forget the positive and negative because that represents two answers. That represents positive 10 squared of 3 over 3 and negative 10 squared of 3 over 3. It's actually two numbers there. This is just a shortcut way of writing those two numbers.
There are going to be times when you move something over and you have a negative number and then you're taking the square root. And so in the real number world, if you have the square root of a negative number, <clears throat> your answer is going to be no solution because in the real number world, the square root of negative one does not exist. Um, however, we have assigned a um, constant. It's actually a constant. We've assigned the letter I to represent the square root of negative one so that you can move forward with certain problems when you get a negative in the root. So it doesn't stop you from being able to, to go on with the problem. All right, and so this is called the imaginary unit I, and we're gonna do a lot more in the next section in the next few minutes with this. But there are gonna be times when you try to solve these and you have a negative in your root. Anytime you have a negative in the root, your answer is going to contain an I because the way you get the negative out of the root is to um, multiply by negative one inside the root, which takes it out with an I. So I represents the square root of negative one. All right. And so if I were to look at different problems, I can say, well, if I have a negative in my root, I can pull it out of the root with the letter I, which represents that imaginary unit. Um, they do point out, which we're going to get to a little bit in the next section, I squared then would equal negative one, because if I take this and square both sides, I just get rid of my root, all right? And so this is what's gonna happen with this problem. When we go to solve it, our rule is to get that z squared by itself. And to get the z squared by itself, I have to subtract 45 from both sides. So I get z squared equals negative 45. Well, you can see that if I take the square root of both sides, I have a negative here in my root. And what this rule allows us to do is to say, well, this is going to equal i, and we still need the plus or minus, square root of 45. I can pull that negative out of the root with that unit i because it represents that negative one inside the, the root. And then I'm going to treat this exactly like I would any other root. I am going to do my factor tree. I'm going to say, well, the threes pair up. The five does not. And so z is going to equal positive or negative 3i, I still have the i there, inside my root I have a 5. All right, so if you end up with a negative in the root, then you can pull it out with an i, all right? property. If x squared equals k, and then there's some scenarios, k is larger than zero, you're going to have two real solutions. So let's say you have 16, that's bigger than zero. Well, if k squared equals 16, it's going to equal the positive or negative root of that, positive or negative four. If it equals zero, you're only going to have one solution because the square root of zero is just zero. You don't have positive or negative zero. If it is less than zero, you're gonna have two what's called complex solutions. Complex is imaginary numbers, which we're about to do, a whole section on complex numbers. And so if it is less than zero, you're gonna have complex solutions or imaginary number solutions, all right? So let's look at complex numbers in general. All right? So section 5.5 is all about complex numbers. The first thing is that a complex number can be expressed in standard form, a plus bi. a is the real part of it. So a is part of your real number set. The coefficient in front of your i is also a part of your real numbers. And then i represents the square root of negative one. So complex numbers include imaginary and real numbers. All right, you have what's called pure imaginary. They do not have a real portion. So if it's just the i and a coefficient, that's considered pure imaginary. Um, imaginary numbers here that have plus or minus are part of your complex. Um, complex also includes real numbers. So all of your real numbers that don't have a piece of the i here, so all of your i portions have a zero there, 
These are just real numbers. They don't have an imaginary piece. So complex puts together imaginary and real numbers. It has a real portion, which is A, an imaginary portion, which is the BI. Standard form always starts with the real part and ends with the imaginary. So real plus the imaginary piece. I'm actually gonna graph these. Um, graphing these actually introduces um, almost like a third axis. So you have like a real axis and an imaginary axis is what happens and so it's not like having a, co a coordinate plane where you have x y which are both in the real number it's actually a different type of coordinate plane it's a coordinate plane that has an axis that is imaginary and an axis that is real versus x and y and so you basically just move according to your coefficients so if this is negative 3 plus 2i you move negative 3 on the real 2 on the imaginary and then your absolute value is going to be your distance well your distance between those uses the distance formula so the distance formula is where this comes from but if i wanted you to find the absolute value here you would just take the square root of the a squared the real part plus the b squared the coefficient part and that would be your um, absolute value of these two and so if you were to look at this one we're not going to graph it. I'm not going to make you graph it on the real and imaginary plane, but it wants you to find the absolute value. Finding the absolute value is really simple. I would just take the square root of the real piece, that's the 4, and square it, plus the coefficient here. Well, the coefficient here is negative 1, and square it. So I have the square root of 16 plus 1. My absolute value here is the square root of 17. All right? So finding the absolute value of a complex number is simple. You use the two numbers that you see, the 4 and the negative 1, which is front of the i. You square those, add them, and take the square root. And this can't be simplified. If I could simplify it, I would. Adding and subtracting imaginary numbers are really simple. You look at it as if you were doing like terms. So if I were to look at this piece right here, I would say, well, I'm going to add my real pieces. And so I'm going to add the 3 plus the 5. So my real portion of this is going to be 8. And then I am going to add the 2i plus the negative 4i. And I'm going to treat that like a coefficient. 2 plus negative 4 is negative 2i. So when you are adding and subtracting, you can think of it as just combining your like terms, comb combining your real portion combining your imaginary portion, all right? Subtracting, same thing, but you are subtracting. Five minus two is going to give me a three. That's my real portion. And then I have negative three, don't forget you're subtracting, minus six. Negative three minus six gives me a negative nine i. So adding and subtracting is really simple. Combine your real parts, combine your imaginary parts, all right? Multiplying is also similar to what you would do with foiling and distribution, all right? So when I distribute, I'm gonna take this 5i and I'm gonna multiply it through. 5i times three, that gives me 15i. 5i times 2i, that gives me 10i squared. Now here's the difference. If this were an x, this would be my answer. All right, but we have to think about what i is. i is the square root of negative 1. And I said I have i squared. What happens when I square a square root? I just cancel the root. So this is actually just negative 1. i squared is the number negative one. So I technically have 15i, that's the square root of negative one. I don't do anything with that, but I have plus 10 times negative one because i squared is just negative one. So that's actually the real part of this number. 10 times negative one is negative 10 and then plus 15i. If I want this in standard form, I list the real part and then the imaginary. So the difference between this and just foiling something with an X is that when you get something squared or cubed or whatever, you're gonna have to think about what that means, all right? And we're gonna talk about that in just a second. Let's look at the foiling one, all right? I have four times two, that gives me an eight. Four times three I, that gives me a 12 I. Negative two times, 2i times positive 2 gives me a negative 
4i, and then negative 2i times positive 3i is a negative 6i squared. I want to combine like terms here. Well, here's the thing. These are obviously alike. This one right here is negative 6 times i squared. Well, i squared we said was negative 1. So that's actually negative 6 times negative 1, which gives me a positive 6. So I actually have two sets of like terms. I have 8 and positive 6 that I can combine. That's 14. Then I do have these, positive 12i, negative 4i. That gives me a positive 8i. So when you have the foiling, you're going to treat it just like you would at first, but then when you go to simplify it, all of your i squareds are actually negative ones, and you can replace those with a negative one. So if I were to foil this, all right, first of all, I want to point out these are conjugates. Remember what we said conjugates are? Three plus a number, three minus a number. All right, so this is a special case, but we're gonna do the entire foiling so you can see what happens here. All right, remember when you foil conjugates, you end up with the first one squared minus the second one squared. So if you remember that, you don't really have to do the whole foiling. Remember we had, um, something like this when we did our foiling, and you always end up with a squared minus b squared, all right? Special case, because your two center terms are gonna cancel. You're gonna end up with a positive three times a negative 15, a po I mean, a, you're gonna end up with a negative 15i and a positive 15i, they're gonna cancel, all right? And so if you take that rule and apply it, I'm gonna take the first one and I am going to square it. Then I'm always subtracting, and I'm gonna take the second one and I am going to square it. All right, let's talk about how we square that second one. Everyone should be able to square this guy. Three squared, obviously, is a nine. For this second piece, I have to square the five. That's a 25. I have to square the i. i squared is what? Is negative one, right? And then I have to square the square root of two. What is the square of the square root of two? just two, I just get rid of the root. So this is times two, all right? So that's what happens when I square that second piece. So I end up with nine minus, 
25 times negative 1 times 2 is what? Negative 50. Negative 50. So I have 9 minus negative 50, positive 59. And you'll see all of your imaginary numbers canceled out. If I had foiled it, the same thing would have happened. 3 times 3 is 9. 3 times negative 5i squared to 2 is negative 15i squared to 2. Positive 5i squared to 2 times 3 is positive 15i squared to 2. And then I end up with minus 5i squared to 2 squared. So you'll see that if I have even foiled it out, these middle terms cancel. That's what happens when you multiply conjugates. All right. If you don't remember that, you can foil it out and your middle terms will cancel. But if you remember, you can go straight to your shortcut. The first one squared minus the second one squared. All right, I want to talk really quickly about this i and what happens when you have multiple ver multiple exponents here. All right, so we already know that i to the first power is just the square root of negative 1 or i. If I square it, though, I have the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1. When you multiply roots by themselves, it just cancels. So that's why this guy equals negative 1. All right, if I have i cubed, I have i squared times i, which is how I get negative i, because i squared is just negative 1. And i to the fourth is negative 1 times negative 1, because that's i squared times i squared, so I get positive 1. And so these four start repeating. You'll notice that if I go to i to the fifth, that's like i to the fourth times i. Well, i to the fourth was just 1. So you'll see that i to the 5th and i are the same one. i to the 6th and i squared are the same. So it always goes by 4s. So there's an easy way to do this. Divide your exponent by 4 and just use your remainder, and it will be one of these three. All right? It will be one of these three. So if I were to simplify these that they give me, um, if we look at the i to the 8th power, right? Um... I'm going to end up with i to the fourth, i to the fourth. I'm actually going to have a remainder of zero. So if I take i to the eighth, I take that eight divided by four, my remainder, it's two remainder, zero. So I'm going to use the i to the fourth. This is going to equal one. If I did i to the ninth, I'm going to do nine divided by four. That's going to be two with a remainder of one. So I'm going to use i to the first power. This is going to equal just i. If I have i to the tenth, I'm going to take the 10 divided by 4. That's 2 remainder of 2. I'm going to use the remainder. i to the second, that's going to be negative 1. So you can have i to a large exponent and just use those 4 to go down it. All right, so let's look at this example. Simplify i to the 59th power. Well, I'm going to take 59, and I'm going to divide by 4, all right? 4 goes into 59, so it go, goes into 5 one time. goes into 19 four times with the remainder of 3. So I'm going to just use the i to the third power, which is just negative i. So they repeat every 4, all right? You're only going to get 4 answers for i to a power. It's either going to be i, negative 1, negative i, or positive 1. That's how it's always going to be. Um, and you can reduce all of them that way.